In the northeastern corner of downtown Portland stands the Skidmore Fountain. This neighborhood is the oldest in the city and was once the heart of Portland's business and cultural district. For many years it had been neglected and as businesses moved uptown towards 6th Avenue, parts were torn down for parking space. The fountain has seen many changes since its dedication on that fine fall afternoon in 1888. And these changes are still going on, as foreseen with the proposed downtown and riverfront plans. But Portlanders had already begun to rediscover this area, visiting the newly renovated historic buildings with their unique restaurants and friendly shops. Portland grew up in this part of town, not far from where the three-masted clippers and steam riverboats used to tie up on Front Street, at first a small collection of tents and wooden storefronts. But these were soon replaced by fancy brick buildings with Baroque facings and a fountain for a horse trough. The Skidmore Fountain proved a coming of age for young Portland, marking the end of a town and the emergence of a city. It was only a little more than 40 years before the fountain was dedicated that Portland was nothing more than a pioneer settlement made up of a few log cabins like this one, belonging to the early settler James Terwilliger, as it looked in 1846. The opening of Canyon Road to through traffic in 1849 allowed the farmers of the Tualatin Valley to bring their produce down to Portland, giving the youthful settlement an advantage as a shipping point over other rival cities along the Willamette. This and the establishment of the only tannery west of the Rocky Mountains by this man, Daniel H. Lounsdale, and the California Gold Rush of 49 attracted trade and increasing numbers of settlers to this young but promising territory. In the early 1850s, a census was taken of the Oregon Territory, locating many of the people by the sound of their axes and cutting down trees, which showed that the stump-cleared area on the west side of the river that was Portland was creeping up to nearly 800 residents. Though at the time the area was still made up mostly of log cabins and unpainted wooden dwellings, it could nevertheless boast of having plank sidewalks and nearly 20 stores. During the decades of the 1860s and 70s, growth came rapidly to Portland. Soon structures that went beyond the simple log cabins and wooden dwellings of the town's earlier years began springing up, like bakeries, hotels, banks like the Ladd and Tilton, which was the first built in Portland, and other places of business. In order to combat the fires which broke out frequently with the growing number of structures in the city, volunteer fire brigades were established. Many of the town's leading citizens and some of its more popular young men like Stephen Skidmore belonged to the four engine companies and one hook and ladder company that were in existence by 1868. And though the brigades were often involved in parades and celebrations, there were those times when the service they were intended for was called upon, as was the case in the early morning hours of August 2nd, 1873, when the worst fire in Portland's history raged through the main district of the town, not burning out until later that day after having consumed a 22-block area. It was said following the fire that because of the narrowness of Portland's streets, Flames were easily able to leap from buildings on one side of the street to those on the other. To this day, many of the streets in Portland remain narrow, such as Ankeny, then called A Street. Why Ankeny Street came to be of such a narrow width stemmed from a difference of opinion back when the area was still only a settlement. 
properties of Mr. Benjamin Stark and Captain John H. Cooch met along the lines where the street is situated. Captain Cooch was always considered a most serviceable citizen, and it is said that in laying off a street, he gave his half for the use of the public, but that Stark refused to meet him halfway, leaving half the street missing ever since. By the mid-1870s, Portlanders considered their city the equal to any in the East. They were riding a street railway system, which the city council stipulated must have cars of the most approved construction for the comfort and convenience of its passengers. They were reading the Daily Oregonian, attending church, supporting public schools, and patronizing the theater. And in those days, that usually meant the 1,200-seat theater on the second floor of the New Market Theater building, built in 1872 at a cost of $100,000. By the time the 80s rolled around, Portland was enjoying a wave of prosperity. The population was pushing 25,000, which did not include the communities on the east side of the river. More and more, buildings were going up, like the Cam Block, which cost in the neighborhood of $125,000. And with the ever-increasing influx of harbor by the 80s, First and Front Streets, being close to this source for the importing and exporting of products, were assuming the distinction of being the first heart of business, cultural, and social activities in the city. One man remembered First Street in those days as a street of neighborly good cheer and stout hearts, from Gleason Street on the north to Salmon Street on the south. Up a block from First Street, Stretching along 2nd Street from Pine to Taylor was the second largest Chinatown in the United States, the largest being in San Francisco. By the 1880s, the Chinese in Portland numbered close to 10,000. The 80s were the Victorian decade in Portland, as was reflected in the architectural designs of the building fronts, strutting lavishly with the brocaded ornamentation of cast iron. And further, by firm morals and ideals, of a resolve to be persevering and to work hard, of unmatched prosperity and optimism, which were characteristics, perhaps no better exemplified than in the person of Stephen Grigg Skidmore. Skidmore, as a young man, displayed that perseverance and devotion to hard work characterizing the early pioneers in Portland, in working himself up from nothing to owning his own business, a pharmacy shown here on the left, just beyond B.L. Stone, watchmaker. Considered one of Portland's leading citizens, he was chosen to be one of several persons sent to the Paris World's Fair of 1878 as representatives of the state of Oregon. While he was there, he had the opportunity to visit the capitals of Western Europe and came away particularly impressed with the fountains he saw. It was then he determined to give Portland a fountain, but not to serve only as a pleasing work of art, but also the benevolent function of a drinking fountain and water trough, for as he expressed it, horses, men, and dogs. But Stephen Skidmore died before he was able to see the fulfillment of his dream. At the time of his death, however, he had a quite substantial estate, and from this he bequeathed $5,000 for a fountain. Immediately, the wheels were set in motion to bring to Portland just such a fountain. A committee was organized, headed by Henry Failing, the first president of the First National Bank in Portland. He sought the advice of Charles Erskine Scott Wood, a local lawyer and former New Yorker who was acquainted with the country's two most outstanding sculptors on getting the very best sculptor for Steve Skidmore's fountain. Eventually, Wood acquired the services of Olin Warner, a renowned sculptor from New York City. When the fountain was dedicated on September 22, 1888, C.E.S. Wood, who conceived the inscription on the west side of the fountain, Good citizens are the riches of a city, delivered the address, moving some to tears and heightening the curiosity of all. And when the veil was finally pulled away, what Warner's genius had created left no one in attendance disappointed, even though beer wasn't flowing from the fountain, as Henry Weinhardt, the brewer, offered to have done on the day of the dedication. And certainly it can be said that the Skidmore Fountain is one of the riches that has been passed on to us from those early years in Portland. But also, its arrival in Portland marked the culmination of an era in the city's history, an era that many feel was more relaxed and easygoing than our present day. Of course, we can never really be certain how relaxed or pleasant those times were. 
But we can be certain, however, that by the end of the 80s, Portland was rapidly entering a new stage in its development, in which it would achieve the status of a major city. And in the process, was leaving behind that early 40-year history of growth, and so too that feeling of excitement and initiative, and a feeling of community which had been so much a part of the development of the city during those years. I'm George McMath, Chairman of Portland's Historic Landmark Commission, and it's our job to administer the Historic Preservation Program in Portland. One of the questions we're very often asked is, why preserve old buildings? Why save an old derelict like the Berkshire Hotel? This is a serious question, and one that can be answered on several levels. First, and probably least important, is the purely artistic reason. But very occasionally, there's a building of such architectural merit that it deserves preservation for that reason alone, much as we preserve a great painting in a museum. But these are very, very few. There's the educational level. By careful examination of an old building, we can tell much about our past, about the economy, about the technology, about the fashion and taste of a particular era. Our buildings tell us about ourselves. They tell us where we've been, what we have done, and hopefully, hopefully what we've been doing. I don't want to suggest, however, that we save all old buildings. Certainly not. Indeed, many old buildings perhaps should not have been built in the first place. What is essential to the quality of urban life that the most significant of these buildings be saved, particularly those that are grouped together where a whole street can give the flavor and scale of a particular era. These districts provide variety. Certainly the Skidmore area with its pedestrian scale, fanciful arches, is different than that 
around the First National Bank building. They provide a choice, and choice is what urban life is all about. But they must be made useful. They must continue as living elements in the community. And this is the challenge to the community. While many of Portland's fine downtown buildings of old have been bulldozed into oblivion, certain important portions of them have been preserved, stored away like old garments in a closet, and are awaiting the time when they may once again dress our city's street with a human scale as they once did before. The key to Portland's chance to retain and renew an active relationship of the buildings of the past to the community's functioning present lies in the unique feature of Portland's finest Victorian architecture, that it was mostly formed of cast iron. Cast iron was molded into ornate forms which were bolted to the outsides of buildings. As cast iron fronted buildings have been demolished in the past years, much of this ornamentation has been removed, preserved, and stored away. On the streets near the river in the Skidmore Fountain area, at the end of the 19th century, Portland had block after block of commercial palaces ornamented with cast iron. Even as late as the 1930s, Front Street looked like the remnant of some great European capital. One very fine example of cast iron front architecture of the period was the Ladd and Tilton Bank. Portland's Ladd and Tilton Bank was built in 1868 and demolished in 1955. But in Salem, the Ladd and Bush Bank still survives, and its facade is cast in the same pattern as Portland's Bank. There are still some segments of the bank in storage in Salem, owned by the U.S. Bank. These could be used as forms for recasting new cast iron parts to be incorporated in a restoration project. That the Ladd and Tilton Bank was one of Portland's most beautiful buildings, no less than the fact that for 23 years, its second floor also housed Portland's first city library facilities, combined to mark it as an ideal prospect for reconstruction. One who speaks for what reconstruction might appear like is Bill Hawkins, an architect and chairman of Friends of Cast Iron Architecture. Portland Friends of Cast Iron Architecture is an organization whose purpose it is to encourage an historic district in the Skidmore Fountain area of downtown Portland. This model is at the heart of our proposal. The project's the creation of a public plaza or square to be known as Ladd Square, named after William S. Ladd, a leading pioneer citizen and builder of Portland's first brick and first cast iron fronted structures in 1853. In this aerial perspective of our proposed restoration of Portland's historic district, you will see where Ladd Square would be located on what now is a parking lot facing Southwest First Avenue between Pine and Ash Streets is just one block south of the Skidmore Fountain. At the south end of the square, at the corner of Southwest First and Pine, would be the Ladd Building of 1881. Its iron parts are presently owned by Benjamin Franklin Savings and Loan Association, who have indicated uh, an interest in seeing them in a restoration project. Just across the street might be a modern building bearing the cast iron facade of the Berkshire Hotel. Its largely cast iron facing is being preserved in storage by the Oregon Historical Society, pending a restoration project such as we are proposing. On the east side of the square is the Smith Block, built in 1872, some of which is still standing, giving a good idea of the promise for a unified historical district. Additional cast iron sections of the Smith Block are in storage throughout the city. To the north lies the Poppleton Building of 1871. It housed Portland's first Chamber of Commerce meetings and is one of the few buildings still standing. In the proposed historic district, there are existing buildings still functioning as commercial businesses, 19 of which are historic structures, an example of the new life to be found in historic buildings. The other buildings are proposed reconstructions which would each bear cast iron facades from many of Portland's most beautiful buildings of the late 19th century. There still exists in the city enough cast iron to complete a district of the size which we have indicated on this map. If such an historic district was one day to become a reality, Portland would be able to display the second largest unified collection of Victorian cast iron architecture in any city in the United States. In 1972, the planning guidelines for the Portland Downtown Plan were adopted by the Portland City Council. Within the guidelines, there were suggestions for an historic district in the Skidmore area. Portland Friends of Cast Iron Architecture is working to bring that historic heritage of Portland's back for our present use and appreciation.
Portland's downtown plan, a map of the downtown behind me, is a result of many years of effort of citizens and Portland city government to define the what and the how for Portland. What should the city of Portland be and how should we get there? The city council in 1972 passed the planning guidelines is a broad scope attempt to set goals and guidelines for the downtown area. They were looking for those aspects which make cities like Portland unique and to try to build upon those unique aspects for the Portland that we want for tomorrow. Things like historical buildings, special views, street furniture, fountains, etc. We have here the Skidmore Fountain Village area which is one of the oldest parts of the city of Portland and embodies many of the unique elements which the plan envisions as permeating the entire Portland downtown area. Around this area, we have planning activity taking place at the present time. We have the Skid Row area. We have the riverfront and we have the 5th, 6th transit malls. It's these malls which I think the average citizen will see first. They're planned to accommodate downtown Portland's transit system. And you will find wide sidewalks, plantings. They'll be the center of a very dense retail core and office complex for the entire downtown. And they will attract lots of pedestrian activity. The pedestrian activity will then rediscover the riverfront flowing from this high density core through this area to the riverfront down streets such as Ankeny Street, in which there are envisioned specialty shops and restaurants. This area, the riverfront, created by the closure of Harbor, which has recently been affected, has three potential planned concepts. This one, which envisions an entirely landscaped solution. Another, which envisions a combination of landscaping and hard public recreational facilities, marinas, and what have you. And a third, which might envision a combination of soft landscaping, hard public recreational, and some commercial activities, such as shops, and that sort of thing. One of the things which the downtown plan wishes to speak to is housing. It is the belief of the downtown plan and the planners that housing in the city is essential for more than a eight hour day. Housing is indicated to occur in all of downtown. Housing for low income here in a revitalized foster hotel, a project which is currently being planned, and housing for the moderate income throughout this district, hopefully in a revitalized waterfront attractive to everybody. A hundred years have passed since many of these buildings were constructed. Many of us think of those past days as more relaxed and easygoing than the present. And so there is a growing concern to reestablish the type of personality this area once had. Citizens who have not walked among these streets for 30 years are now coming back to see the renewal. And in the last few years, changes have been rather rapid. Today, the Skidmore Fountain and Old Town areas, separated by Burnside Street, are in the midst of a social and economic change. It began with the J.C.'s restoration of the Skidmore Fountain and the gradual return of shopkeepers to the area. Here they find more freedom. Many shopkeepers have been in other businesses and other professions. Some have chosen to have another kind of business. They find they have greater choice as to the hours they keep and the things they sell.
Similarly, people find a different quality in a variety of merchandise not found in other areas of town. Many of the goods are of the craft nature, handmade by the proprietor or created by independent craftsmen. So one finds a different pace, a different kind of merchandising, and some friendly people. The theater building is really kind of a, a landmark for the whole area. You know, it was built 101 years ago, and at that time it was, in fact, a marketplace, and the second floor was an opera house, and the third floor was a cafe. But after about 20 years or so, it just closed down, and ever since then it's either been a warehouse or, like it's right now, a parking garage. And so we thought, well, why not try to make it into something livable again? And so we, a group of us got together and planned it with the uh, Skidmore Fountain Village Association, and the, our newspaper, Old Portland Today, uh, we planned uh, an old-fashioned Christmas festival and bazaar and turned the first floor back into a marketplace like it was when it was built back in 1872. You know, the old-fashioned Christmas festival and bazaar was just kind of an idea we dreamed up one night we want to, we're trying to get ideas and ways of making people aware of, of the old town and the Skidmore Fountain area. Of course, I'm really fascinated by the, the New Market Theater building in, myself. But to me, it seems to be an absolute shame that this fantastic building is being used for, to park cars and, and give them lube and oil changes. Uh, it should be a marketplace. It should be turned back into a theater again. And maybe with the response we've had these two days, somebody might come up with the idea, well, maybe it's financially feasible and they'll go ahead and try it and return this building back to what it once was.